In a series of posts on Twitter over the weekend, Houdain said the NGO tried to bribe him to write an article discrediting Dangote refinery. He claimed he was offered 800,000 naira, that's the equivalent of 500 US dollars, to write a smear piece against the refinery under the pretext of environmental concerns. I thought that it's in the public interest. Um, people need to know that um, there are external interests that have some sort of a stake or some sort of an interest in um, the preservation of the, the energy poverty that Nigeria and West Africa have historically faced. Um, I don't believe that uh, my my going public with it in itself is going to change the world or anything like that i don't think my my profile is that powerful however i think that the power of public exposure is one of the last few real powers that regular people in this part of the world still have i feel like um a lot of the power that these foreign actors wield can be wielded because it's wielded in secret because people don't even know that it exists so prior to this incident, for example, if you were to come out and tell people that there are players in the in the global development space or the NGO space who would very much like the status quo to be preserved in terms of Africa being poor and Nigeria suffering from energy poverty, despite being one of the world's largest energy exporters, it will sound like it's a conspiracy theory. But here you have hard evidence of a Western NGO, UK NGO funded by American money, quietly moving around, trying to arrange the pieces on the chessboard to create a narrative war against what objectively, regardless of whatever one thinks about the owner of the refinery, objectively, that refinery, which, by the way, is also the largest single investment ever made in the history of West Africa, $20 billion. And there's this narrative war against this refinery being fought essentially by white people in, in London and New York, and then they're trying to use an African face to be the spearhead of this narrative war. That does not sit right with me, and I thought the public needed to know. And it makes one wonder whether, you know, there's a link between this and why Nigeria's uh, four refineries have refused uh, to work for over 10, um, 10 years now, over a decade now. Uh, do you think that this is the, the MO of foreign entities uh, to stop uh, development, not only in Nigeria, but in Africa as a whole? I mean, even before this happened, I, I, I happen to have quite close relationships with several people who work in and around the energy space. I myself work in the energy space, although in the sort of renewable part of the space. And one thing you will always hear is that getting funding for energy projects in Africa is almost impossible nowadays. Because you will hear things like ESG, you hear things like you know, energy transition, um, uh, fossil fuels are, are are bad. So basically, you're trying to get a pipeline constructed from Uganda, which recently discovered oil and gas reserves. So you're trying to get a pipeline constructed from Uganda through Tanzania to the port. So Uganda can actually benefit from its oil reserves. It can actually export oil and earn revenue to build infrastructure. Right, because most of Nigeria's infrastructure, for example, was built with oil revenue. Uganda doesn't have that infrastructure because they simply don't have the money. And now they have the opportunity to earn that money using their oil revenue. And then the financing to actually build the pipeline is being blocked because they are being told that you are not allowed to uh, build any energy infrastructure that has to do with, with fossil fuel because of emissions. Meanwhile, Africa is responsible for 3.9% of global emissions. We don't register on the ranking. We might as well not exist. So what emissions are we cutting? We don't have anything to cut. You are looking at a starving man. His ribs are showing. This person is malnourished. He's about to drop dead. They are telling him that he needs to go to the gym and exercise and lose weight. That's what they're telling us. It makes no sense. Yeah, this is what... Right? Uh, this, this is, is not just... A, this, uh, not, this is a, a pan-African phenomenon right. prior to this. Sorry, sorry. So this is what uh, Dialogue Earth uh, said you should do in carrying out a spare campaign uh, against the Dangote uh, refinery. And I'm wondering, uh, now, you have been offered $500, you turned it down. Uh, is there any chance that other journalists or other individuals or entities may have been approached by not just this Dialogue Earth, but by other foreign entities, you know, to uh, scuttle major projects in Nigeria? 
absolutely 100 percent um first of all with this particular in instance i'm pretty sure that i wasn't the only journalist that they would have reached out to i'm quite sure even though i can't prove that yet um but even in in the aftermath of going public they already sort of mobilized a narrative response so i'm not going to mention the name of the news platform or the journalist involved but there's already uh, been that pushback where they've sponsored articles in two major Nigerian online news mediums and referred to what I did as sensationalist, that essentially it's not that big a deal that I kind of misrepresented what was being done. And I'm and basically that I'm an attention seeker and I did it to, I don't know, <laughs> to, to chase cloud or something that is really not that big a deal. That's the narrative that they've mobilized and they've sponsored it and put it on two Nigerian media platforms already who are happy to publish it as they always are. Um, moving away from Nigeria, I've, I've, I have personal knowledge of incidents like this, where, for example, the EACOP, uh, which is a, a pipeline that is supposed to connect Uganda and Tanzania to the port in Tanzania. There are, there are native Ugandans and Tanzanians who have been paid by these foreign civil society actors. They've been, their um, visas to the US have been facilitated to so basically go to the US and speak to American uh, audiences, including financiers and politicians and whatnot, and tell those people, influential people, that funding a project that is going to lift their African country out of poverty is bad for the environment, right? And these people will listen to them because it's, a, it's an African saying it. Obviously, you cannot love an African's country more than the African himself. Meanwhile, they are being paid to do that. That may not necessarily be even what they believe. It's the NGO that is paying them money to do that. I think there's a very serious moral problem with that. Mm. And I'm wondering why $500? I mean, uh, is that how uh, cheap these uh, foreign bodies uh, see African journalists, you know, like yourself? And is this the first time you'll be approached, you know, to do such a hatchet job? And how did you, uh, you know, respond or react um, if it's not the first time? So clearly, that is how much they think African journalists, uh, or, or, or how much they think it takes to compromise an African journalist or to co-opt an African journalist's voice. Um, because, you know, whether we like to, to hear it or not, the truth is that journalism on the continent is just generally not a very financially rewarded activity for most practitioners. So... I'm guessing the market price that they that they have become used to that this is what usually gets people to to say how high when they ask them to jump is this much. Um, it's it's not the first time that I've been approached in terms of being commissioned to write a story or to write an article. It's a fairly common thing actually within the journalism space. Um, if you have a good writing style that people like, or if you have a large audience, you get approached. And it's not the first one that I've turned down for ideological reasons. You know, sometimes I'll turn it down. Maybe it's some entity that wants me to write about Israel versus Palestine. And I'm like, you know what? I don't really feel comfortable writing about this. I don't feel like I personally should be commenting on this. I don't feel like I personally have a stake. And I don't feel like I should interfere in this. So I turn it down. But this is the first time that someone has come to me with an offer to write about something that affects my country and that affects me potentially and basically told me to write against my own interests. Mm. How do you expect, um, what kind of outcome do you expect after this um, revelation, especially on the part of government? What are your expectations? Um, I expect the government to do absolutely nothing, as they always do. Um, the purpose of this wasn't to try and get a response from the government, but it was to educate the public, because I think that it's only the public now that can actually rescue this thing. Because clearly, the government of the day at the very least, um, doesn't really seem to care. I'm, I'm being charitable in saying this, but at the very least, doesn't really seem to care whether Dangote Refinery takes off or not. I think that, again, regardless of whatever anyone's personal feelings and opinions are about the person of Aliko Dangote, I think it would be a disaster for Nigeria and for Africa if a $20 billion investment dies. That absolutely should not happen. But I think the Nigerian government is, at the very least, completely lukewarm about it. Um, we've seen uh, officials from from the, uh, oil regulators come out and make statements that sound like it's a competitor that made the statement. We saw an official come out and say that well, the uh, Dangote refineries uh, diesel um, has sulfur content that is above regulatory limits, and that in any case, it shouldn't be 
that one man shouldn't supply the energy, shouldn't control the energy market for Nigeria, which is true. But again, it shouldn't be a regulator coming out to say that because it almost sounds as if the government has been antagonistic toward a private business in Nigeria, which is incredible. So um, I, I, my hope in, in going public with this was for Nigerian people to understand that there is there is, there's a network of interests that would very much like to preserve Nigerian poverty, that would very much like to see them continue being poor, and that for the first time, um, there is an opportunity to sort of very, very frontally and very visually oppose these interests. Because as I said earlier, how these interests have generally worked in the past is by operating in the shadows. Occasionally, when they meet people like myself, people in the media space, they're able to get their way one way or the other. But now they were unfortunate enough to run into someone like me who you know, has a reputation for being a bit of a hothead. And I guess they regret that now. And I guess this has, the, the fact that people can now see this hard evidence that this is the sort of skullduggery going on in the background, that this is not a conspiracy theory, this is real, this happened, this is in black and white, then I think that does an important job of sort of rewiring the mental architecture of Nigeria so that they understand that um, you actually do have enemies, both local and international, and you need to start being serious about being an active citizen because if you're not, there are people who are very happy to sort of occupy that space for you and keep you exiled.